Time for the Penn State Blue White Breakdown, the Ty Howell edition. Penn Lies Penn State Football Podcast. I'm Bob Flounders, joined by Greg Pickle. We want to talk about a couple Penn State coaching hires, but we're going to start with <clears throat> the uh, the young man. He's only 29, Greg. He's what? He's about the same age you are, or maybe a little older. Little older. Year older, Bob. Year older. Um, Ty Howell. We just heard from him on a Zoom call. Uh, I can remember when he played at Penn State. I didn't really realize how I don't he was at Penn State for like like six years I think he was originally a member of the 2008 class but ended up uh he was a captain uh he finished his career as a starter on the 2013 team I think a center played a little guard too but uh a guy that I think Greg first of all when you're 29 and you land a gig as a as a as a position coach at a school like Penn State. I think that's a sign, and especially James Franklin, who has a list for everything. That's a sign that you are very well liked, and I think uh, it's safe to say he is a guy that is definitely on the rise in major college coaching because you just don't see that happen very often. He's coached some other places. He was an analyst at Penn State the year before. Tyler Bowen moves on and James Franklin does not promote from outside. <laughs> he or does not choose a candidate from the outside, Greg. He, he promotes from within. Ty, how, what did you think of his uh, initial 30 minute press conference with uh, you, me, and about 35 of our good friends? Yeah, I couldn't agree with what you just said more, Bob. Clearly this guy is on the, the rise in the coaching world. There's no doubt about it. Very much like Tyler Bowen in that regard. Remember, Tyler Bowen became the offensive coordinator at Fordham long before he ended up at Penn State. Uh, Ty Howe, of course, was the co-offensive coordinator and associate head coach under Charlie Fisher at Western Illinois. So he's obviously uh, kind of on a similar progression there. And these two worked closely together last year. Uh, uh, as the you know, he was a, an off-field analyst, but I know he spent a lot of time with Ty. Or I'm sorry, with Tyler Bowen, and of course with Kirk Shiraka as well. And he presents himself in a way, Bob, that he sounds like a guy who's you know been in this role before. He sounds like a guy who's ready to be in this role. And even though he was an offensive lineman, just like uh, Tyler Bowen was, he clearly knows how to coach the tight end position. He clearly knows what it takes to get a, a winning mentality out of those guys and improvement out of those guys based on his past stop. So uh, I think it makes a lot of sense, especially when you sit and listen to him, you can just imagine how much he must impress James Franklin and some of the other people around college football. So that was a pretty astute hire by James Franklin to get him back in an analyst role last year, which set the table, of course, for this promotion. Even Ty Howe said that he didn't think it would happen this quickly, but he's always wanted to be a position coach. He's always wanted to coach at Penn State. Certainly, you would have to think he has bigger aspirations than that one day. But uh, for a guy who's 29, he certainly sounds like he's been around a long time and uh, this is the right fit, I think, for Penn State at the right time. And, you know, we know that Tyler Bowen did a lot of recruiting and he was very good at that, not just tight ends, but other positions, too. And I think we're going to come to find that a lot of prospects are going to relate to Ty Howe, just like they related to Tyler Bowen, which is a very good way. Yeah, and I think one of the reasons why he's a, <clears throat> a position coach at such a young age is he talked about it played at Bunn High School, B-U, I looked it up, B-U-N-N High School, small school in North Carolina. It was a single-A program, bumped up to 2A, I think, his final year. Um, a member of Penn State's 08 recruiting class, but his dad was a longtime coach in North Carolina high school football, and he was talking about when he first got interested in maybe being a coach and he said it, I think he said high school was when he started. So I think, you know, <clears throat> he's kind of an old 29 in a good way in that. I think he's always wanted to do this. He's always probably kind of, you know, I think he's always looked at himself as a future coach, maybe more than an NFL player, obviously. And I think he's, he's kind of been one of those guys that as he went along in his career, Greg, <clears throat> he paid close, close attention to his position coaches, his head coaches. I'm sure he's had some mentoring, but I, I do think that uh, he's he's been trying to do this for a while. And I think that 
it speaks to why he's been able to be a success so soon, real quick. You know, <clears throat> they got to replace Pat Fryermuth, but, you know, there's some pretty nice young players uh, returning at Penn State. Uh, not Zach Koontz. Zach Koontz is moving on in the transfer portal. But there's there's two or three uh, talented young tight ends that are already in the program. There's probably more coming in the pipeline if they uh, hold by their, their verbal commitments. Um, but I, I don't – you look at the tight end position and you no Friar move, no more Tyler Bowen. But to me, this does not feel like a position of concern for Penn State. I think the last month of the season when – when Brenton Strange and Theo Johnson played a lot was really important to Penn State's offense moving forward because they looked comfortable. Um, he had some really nice things, Greg, to say about Tyler uh, Warren, uh, who's Penn State's number three tight end, high school quarterback from Virginia. Uh, when you look at, a, at the room, um, the tight end room, do you agree with a lot of what Ty Hal, Ty Hal had to say about Brenton Strange, Theo Johnson, and Warren? Yeah, I do, Bob. I think the biggest concern you have there isn't what kind of talent those guys can put on the field, because we saw with two of them that they can be very good in the Big Ten, that they're not the moment's not too big for them and that they should only improve this offseason. So I think your biggest concern is depth. You know, you enter this year with Strange and Johnson. You have Tyler Warren, who by all accounts has really kind of taken a nice step forward, even though it was such a weird first year for him to be on campus. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, he did see some action maybe in the Illinois game and one other time perhaps in 2020, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, he got his feet wet a little bit at this level too. And then you have Khalil Dinkins coming in from North Allegheny. So, yeah, he has plenty to work with. There's no doubt about that. I think the, the biggest concern, of course, is just going to be uh, if you would ever get in a position like you did with the running back room in 2020 where – uh, a great situation suddenly became pretty scarce numbers wise. That would be the only concern I have for that room because I think Brenton strange has showed that, you know, he maybe wasn't the most flashy recruit when they signed him, but he right. certainly looks the part. There's no doubt about that. And we know that Theo Johnson is already uh, on the path of being able to realize that high four-star potential that he had in high school. So, you know, you add Warren and Dinkins to the mix and it's a good looking room. There's no doubt. And who knows, you know, there could be a, I doubt there'll be a transfer portal guy, but you never know. It's 2021, so anything's possible. And I think Ty House certainly has plenty to work with in this offense. And Mike Yersich, I'm sure, has some good ideas too. Yep. Okay, let's move along uh, and talk about the other. Uh, it's, it's, I don't think it's official yet, but it's, it's all but a certainty that Anthony Poindexter is going to be uh, a Penn State defensive assistant. Um, Penn State has an opening because Tim Banks, their, their veteran safeties coach, is now the coordinate, defensive coordinator at Tennessee. Uh, Poindexter coached, I think he was the co-defensive coordinator, I believe, at Purdue, uh, at least last year and maybe the year after that. But um, <clears throat> when news of this leaked, Greg, did this is this a name that you would uh, – uh, I'm familiar with him as a player. I can remember he was a really good player at Virginia. Um, but I, I don't, you know, I, I don't, I don't know that a lot of people maybe mentioned him in connection with Penn State. It's, you know, it's the safety's job. So, you know, it's going to be hard to really know who the top defensive uh, safety's coaches are in college football. But at any early read on, on this hire and maybe what, what the tie is with James Franklin and Poindexter? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is, you know, he was obviously a tremendous safety at Virginia, as you mentioned, a college football Hall of Fame inductee, multi-time All-American. So he kind of continues that trend that we saw with Taylor Stubblefield and to an extent Phil Troutwine as well, where guys who were really, really good players in college have worked their way up through the coaching ranks. And James Franklin's looking at them and saying, OK, you did it at the highest level when you played. Now we need to get these guys at these positions to do it but to me 
you know, the biggest advantage I think Penn State could have here is obviously the safeties room is that, but, you know, the recruiting aspect of it is where I think a lot of people's attention is going to turn quickly, assuming this gets done. And I'm sure it will the moment we stop recording, but, you know, (laughs) he's uh, obviously spent a lot of time at Virginia, I think 11 seasons, maybe. I don't know if that's a combo of coaching and playing. I can't recall, but anyway, he was there for a long time. Then he went to Connecticut. Then he joined Jeff Brom's staff when Brom took the Purdue job. So he's been in the Big Ten. He's recruited all over the place. But, you know, when they lost Tyler Bowen, they lost a good connection in the Delaware, Maryland, Washington, D.C., Virginia area. And I think they really have a chance to get that back here, uh, assuming he comes on board. So I'm sure we'll hear something official on that at some point this week. But, yeah, uh, not necessarily a guy who came top. You know, when James Franklin makes these hires, you know, it's interesting because you have such a wide range of uh, possibilities now to consider when these jobs come open. I mean, we've seen the Ty Howe promotion now. We saw the big splash with Mike Yersich. You know, we've seen him go and get other uh, Big Ten coaches who maybe were out of a job. That's a Tim Banks. Uh, We've seen him move coaches around position wise, like he did with David Corley when a rock star like Jaywan Sider became available. So, you know, there's not necessarily um, I I think I guess what I'm getting at here is it used to be able to kind of narrow down who he could be looking at based on a couple of factors. And it feels like those factors have really expanded over the last couple of hirings. And I think that's just because of what Penn State can offer, both money wise and competition wise and everything else. So they've seemingly been able to get, uh, you know, go some different directions here that we haven't seen before. But, yeah, you don't see a ton of in-conference movement, especially at this time of the year. But I think Poindexter can improve this staff. And I know we'd probably say that about just about anyone, but the fact that he did it at such a high level as a player, and we know he has re- tremendous recruiting chops, and we know he's put guys into the NFL and, and developed them at the all Big Ten level uh, since he's been a coach, all AAC level, whatever. Um, I think certainly uh, there's plenty of reason to see why James Franklin decided to go this direction. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what he can do with uh, – we're assuming, Greg, right, that he will be <clears throat> assigned specifically to the safeties. So he'll probably have a couple other duties as well. I don't see – I mean, I know he was a co-defensive coordinator, but the guy played safety, so I can't imagine him not heading up uh, the safety development. And Penn State needs to develop its safeties, I think, a little bit better. We've talked past podcasts about the fact that we're always having to borrow from other positions – to kind of get some starting safeties on the field. I don't know how much of that is a big priority for James Franklin to actually, you know, recruit safety prospects and develop them. But like, Greg, I'm just wondering for, you know, obviously Jaquan Brisker's back. They, they got to replace Lamont Wade. Jonathan Sutherland is, is almost in my mind, like a special teams captain first. And then if he can play like some reps at safety, that's, that's a bonus because of his value uh, on special teams. You just wonder, a guy like Enzo Jennings, who was a pretty big recruit um, in the 2020 class, but just didn't very play very much. And there could have been reasons for that that we don't know about. But I sure kind of thought maybe we would see a little bit more of Enzo Jennings uh, in year one. But I know that he was a, a pretty coveted recruit out of Michigan. We didn't see him. You just wonder what year two is going to look like for Enzo. He's got a new position coach. And we'll see. But I do think that I think Penn State's got to get its act together when it comes to recruiting and developing their safety prospects because they just had to borrow from other positions too often. And who knows, maybe Poindexter is a guy that can get uh, some better production uh, out of some guys that were some pretty, there's some pretty high level recruits that just haven't really developed for one reason or another, but we'll see if maybe Poindexter can get that thing that pipeline established because I think that's been something we always talk about their past deficiency, uh, their past defense deficiency issues. And you just wonder if maybe some of that is tied to getting more consistent play out of safety recruits. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt about it. And I mean, you look at some of the other guys in that room. They have Jair Brown, who came yep. in uh, from Lackawanna as well. You have Tyler Rudolph. You could still move a corner over. We've certainly seen them mm-hmm. try that before. So I don't think it would shock anybody if spring practice opens and there's a, a, some experimentation going on. So, yeah, I think the things that fans should be most excited about is maybe just some fresh ideas back there. I think that 
you know, when you and I talk to our tech subscribers and just Penn State fans in general, we get, especially during the season, there are a lot of people frustrated with how the pass defense has been over the last couple yeah. of years in two areas. One, getting beat over the top all the time, but two, a lack of turnovers. And, yeah. you know, if, if, if so if some fresh ideas back there can, you know, you know, some of it's probably schematic, but if some fresh ideas back there can turn at least one of those two things around, yeah. you know, I think you're obviously going to grade the, the, the point Dexter higher in a much obviously better light than if not. So I think it helps, you know, that group's Brent Pry, Terry Smith, Tim Banks was together for a while. And it's not that they put bad defenses on the field and Sean Spencer, I guess we shouldn't uh, forget about either, but you know, they've, and they've had some very good statistical defenses, but we've heard two kind of themes over the years. One was trying to fix the pass defense and two was being more aggressive when it comes to turnover so if point dexter brings with him at least some marginal improvement in those two areas it'll yeah. be a win for penn state and then again to your point if he can go out and secure some of these defensive back commits that have maybe uh, gotten away from penn state over the years especially in this region i think that'll be a big deal as well so interesting fit i'm sure it'll be official like i said as soon as we're done recording but <laughs> Yeah, the three new coaches for Penn State heading into the uh, the 2021 season, and it's been interesting to kind of follow how they've gone about making those changes. Yeah, yeah, it's three and counting, Greg. It's three and counting because you never know what's going to happen uh, next. So, yes, got a chance today to talk to Ty Howe, Penn State's new tight ends coach, who was a Penn State offensive lineman, played for Joe Paterno and also played for Bill O'Brien. Um, he's now he's now coaching the tight ends, and I would imagine uh, in the next couple of days it'll be made official that um, Anthony Poindexter is now the latest uh, Penn State assistant on the defensive side, uh, filling in for Tim Banks, who is now at Tennessee. All right, Greg, let's uh, let's put a lid on that. Let's put a lid on this. Uh, on this podcast, as they say in political circles, it's been a fast 15 minutes. Um, we might be, I might be talking to Dave with Dave Jones about some things in a, in a day or two. You never know. But uh, for now, it was nice to, to hear from Ty Howe. And then hopefully we'll be able to hear from Poindexter um, after he's hired. And we'll get some more info on maybe how this, all, this whole thing came about. But that's it for this edition of the Blue White Breakdown Penn, Penn Lies Penn State Football Podcast.